That's great. I'm glad to hear it. I can I can tell it in your voice. Um, this is the second time that I've called, but it was a couple years ago. And you gave me some things to do, which I did and I'm still doing. Um, but I had I had two questions. One is uh, since COVID's been over, I, I took on a puppy. I adopted one. Uh, and it and it feels really, really psychic between he and I. Like I, uh, I ask him questions and then I'll have a dream and he'll tell me things. So, or he'll show me things. He doesn't really tell me, but um, I'm having lots of problems with him and his food. And I don't, I've tried everything. So he doesn't like kibble. I feed him uh, fresh ground beef or chicken livers or everything. And after a while, he just always gets sick and he'll throw up and I just you're giving, I don't, him, you're giving him too rich of a food and he's a puppy. How old is he? Well, he's two years and like three months, four you're months. Now. Giving, you're giving him too rich of a food. You're better off as to going to one of those high end pet smart stores and go and find the food that they keep in the refrigerator. Yeah. And get he, something like that and see how he is. And you have to start feeding him less or feed him twice a day where you give him two meals a day, but at, you're cutting the meal in half. Okay. Well, I I have done the pet food thing. I've given him all different kinds. I even took him to a homeopathic person, and um, she gave me stuff to kind of help clear out his system. He he won't eat almost anything. <laughs> no dry food. No canned food. No fresh pet from you know the fridge. Uh, he loves okay, so the. He's telling me I want you to be my chef, bitch. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he is a he's little like, spicy. You want the psychic information? Give me the real food. That's the <laughs> deal here, woman. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he loves well, a little bit of everything. What do you want me to cook for you today? And with that, we will exchange psychic visions. Yeah, I told him. I I, I mentioned that to him today because I'm like I, I don't know what else to do because I'm now I'm cooking two or three times and like I do what you said like I give him a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening and he'll just look at it until it gets dried up. Um, but I will. Yeah, it's, not what he, it's not what he wants. Yeah, because it's not what he wants. So then I put something else out. What, what and, is it that he really wants? Is he wants the food you're eating? Yeah, but he can't have that. No, no um, onions, no garlic, no nothing like that. That's what makes him throw up. Uh, well, that's toxic. Supposedly toxic to uh, dogs is uh, oh, that kind of stuff. No chocolate. I, I no. That stuff all the time. I live oh, yeah? sixteen. Yeah, I know chocolate yeah. is toxic to dogs. Supposedly, garlic and onions are too. So we're but, Greek, so we have garlic and onion and just about everything. <laughs> the only thing my dog wouldn't eat, he'd spit out cucumbers. Yeah, he doesn't like anything. He doesn't like fruit. He doesn't like vegetables. He, he only likes meat. And I, I, I worried because, you know, I don't want it to be feeding him something that's eventually going to be harmful. But out in the wild, you know, wolves and dogs, they just ate meat. They didn't, sure. they didn't sure. eat rice and carrots. Pure, pure protein. I'm sorry. So, so that was that's all pure protein. So, do you know what kind of dog it is? What kind of mix he is? Well, he's he looks like well, he's a poodle mix with either like Maltese or I think he's part um, Westie because he's thick in the middle. But he's all uh, white. He, he has he's got some inbreeding. Go in. He's got some he's got some inbreeding in him. That's what it means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's got a a pink nose, amber eyes. And yeah. he's all white. Yeah. So you, you're just going to have to find out what you can buy, like find a local butcher and you can buy scraps and stuff like that. Yeah. And you have to keep it somewhat cold, but not frozen. He may mm. not like frozen meats he may not like um, and go with that. Okay. That's all you can do at this point. You love this dog. You got to find what he can eat. Yeah. Oh, I, I've, you know, I've had him for over a year now. And so we, we're just still working it out. And so I thought maybe if I brought it up to you, you might be able to 
See, so well, you're this, telling this is, this is for you to work out, but obviously this is this dog's karma too. He probably had a shitty life last time where you you know, he's like, I want real food. I'm gonna come in as a dog and find a human that's gonna make me real food. I want a chef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, I do, I do cranial sacral therapy and Reiki. So I treat him all the time. Um, and yeah, work with him like don't that. Over, don't over treat your dog. Otherwise he won't be able to work, work on himself. Oh, okay. That's something like limit it to like twice a month. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Learn to, um, to have close time with the dog that isn't you healing. Well, most of the time it's not. We're walking, we're talking. We're, Does he you like know. to sit, sit on your lap? No, he doesn't like to be picked up. The only time he likes to be cuddled is early in the morning. He sleeps on the edge of the bed. He's not one of those ones that wants to come yeah, up and get under your covers or anything. He's a watcher. That's why. He's watching. So that. So he's, does that mean he's watching? He's a good guard dog. Is that why he's watching? Yeah, that's, that's in his genes. That, that's the gene part of the poodle. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, do I have time for another question? Uh, yeah. Tell me about uh, what we talked about last time and what were you able to put into effect? Okay. So um, I was talking to you about the babies that I work with because I work with uh, like babies who have tongue tie or torticollis or, you know, new to pre crawling babies. And um, you had told me to work, I could work with colors, but I, I actually haven't done that because my business has kind of been slow this mm -hmm. past year. Um, but I, I do. Uh, I've been using red light therapy on myself, and I do think that that might help some of the some of the babies. But the the big thing that I took away from that as well was you wouldn't let me hang up until you told me about myself, which I was not trying to hear at the time. But um, you told me to go and get um, not Reiki. What is it? And not Rolfing. It was. Oh, some kind of body work, and it's an energy type of work. Myofascial. Yes, that was it, and yeah. and I have been doing it ever since, and my body has completely changed. Um, I'm still, you know, kind of working on things because I have um, vertigo. I have Meniere's disease, and okay. so um, so it's been like two and a half years or something, or almost three that I've been going to that practitioner. And he's, he's really, really good. Um, you also told me to do uh, floating, but because of the Meniere's, I, I don't do floating. Okay. Um, Cause it makes, you know, being in water and having the water move, it makes me, it brings on the dizziness, I but I'm sorry, go ahead. And I understand that. Okay. Um, so those were the things I put into effect at the time I was doing a lot of the, um, revocations. And I mean, like several times a week and the heart, the heart, uh, meditation. And mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten really busy at work and I just haven't been able to do them as much. But the sec, the question that I wanted to ask is, I feel like I'm kind of stuck. I, I, my house, I can't keep it clean. I'm, I'm working the two jobs. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm exhausted, but I don't feel like I have the energy to do it. And I, I look really young, but I turned like 66 this year. Uh -huh. And, um, I don't, I just, I, I took, started taking Jardians for the uh, diabetes and I lost a lot of weight. I walked him twice. I walk him twice a day for, you know, 20 to 40 minutes each time. Um, and I just, I don't know why I can't get my house in order because that project management is what I've done my whole life and I can't seem to get it together here. And I wanted to ask you if you had any suggestions for me, because I could hire somebody, but I've been robbed more than once. So I, I kind of don't want anybody in here. Okay. So let me be plain and blunt with you. Okay. You've reached a point in your life. You are not the spring chicken you were before. No, you're right. And you're now reaching the point where your inner self and the ego have to come to terms with you're not the spring chicken anymore. 
and that you need help to do things. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can... there's, more, there's more behind those blunt words, but for you to be able to hear it, you actually have to look why you're so out of energy to do your own work. When are you going to retire? You're 67. No, is I'm retirement 60, even I'm, a reality? Is retirement even a reality for you? Possibly, but I, I what I was trying to do and and why I pushed out my retirement, um, and I work in healthcare, but in the IT part of it, uh, mm -hmm. is I wanted to add an ADU in the backyard so I could set myself up to have um, income coming in after I retire, and I do have some, you know, I do have pension and that kind of thing but you know it's not it's not a lot uh in terms of what i need for california and all of my baby body work um uh people are here you know the ones that refer me the client, and the, the, the community you, right, the clientele that you build up yeah, yeah it's it's all here so i did i i could move to atlanta where my sisters are but i i would have to restart with you know all my credibility and stuff and so also uh i can't move there for my job so I, I was trying to do an adu here and i i actually got a heloc uh approved but i haven't signed it yet um because how it's how much is the home equity line of credit for the, uh, for three hundred and fifty thousand, and that and would allow me to put um a garage where i could do my baby body work and um uh an apartment on the top that i could rent out and then fix the um, wiring in the house i live in and the foundation okay. so but the, so, the let, i've been told give, to wait because of the rates let me give you a little advice here okay you do not want an apartment that you're renting out above your baby energy place period oh okay you, you have still not answered is retirement a reality for you three if you were to open your 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 personal place in the place that you are right now it will take you a year and a half to go through just the approvals in the in the um getting right. a permit or longer permitting yeah. 69 by the time you might just start building and it might take a year for them to do it assuming there's no other per permitting issues that makes you 70. yeah so the reality is california is not business friendly for you that has to sink in along with retirement you got to go to some place where your retirement funds actually will go a much longer way, way. simple as that you got to face the reality of a 67 year old woman who will have to restart her business somewhere else but that's the beauty of, of retirement it will allow you to restart it in such a way that you can make sure you don't make the same mistakes and there's all sorts of things you could do to take information from one group to another videos that you can do ways that you can do advertising and obtain something that will be half the rent value or, or even less than half okay or more than half sorry that's the reality you have to face. You can't do it all on your own anymore. You've reached a point where your body is telling you, I'm going to shut down because we don't have the energy to do this work. And there's part of you that's ignoring that message from your own body. Doing two jobs, can't do it anymore. Yeah, it's difficult. I realize that maybe that's why my business slowed down. Is because you know, it was down because you were splitting your efforts between the two and you weren't putting the hundred percent effort like you believed you were. In reality, people could tell you're tired, you're exhausted, you're not putting the same effort to work with clients, and it's slowly degraded energy, as well as it's a niche market that means you constantly have to be promoting yourself and getting clients and hustling for them. Mm. Yeah, I, I do have people that refer. I have IBCLCs and and I, you know I'm yeah. on the mommy groups, but you're right, I don't I don't do a lot of, of self-promotion other than the referrals. Right. 
So, so those number are one, have, those are the facts you have to face. Okay. And if you continue to ignore those, ignore those facts, the next thing you will be a seventy years old with with a now a three hundred thousand dollar HELOC loan in California. And who the hell who knows what California is going to look like three years from now? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was worried about that. So, all right. Well, I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Face the facts of where you're at and come up with a new business model that includes getting out of the two job scenario. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. look at it. You'd be surprised how many how many places that you could extend your work and get yourself noticed over there. But if, you're, if your heart isn't into letting go of the other job so that your mind and your genius can be focused on one thing instead of split into two, you'll be able to project manage yourself again. Yeah, I just, I, I want to give up, you know, to retire from my other job that I've been at for 20 years. But I just wanted to make sure you know, I'm the I'm the only person that I can um, depend upon for uh, income. I can't depend upon anybody else. I don't have a, a children or a husband, so um, that's why I was so trying the reality to. Reality is retirement is not reality for you. Not right now. You got to learn to make it reality for you. I mean, you got to move to some place that will support what you do have in retirement. And start your business from there. And that's why you're stuck. Because you know any effort you put into this house right now is going to be treading in, in like treading molasses. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. I got right, it. Jeff, thanks a lot for calling. I got to move on to the next caller. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a really good day. Yes. And we are joined by David Ellis. How are you doing today, David? David, you're muted. David? Yes. There we are. How's it going today, David? Yes, I was speaking into a muted mic. Right, I do it all the time. All right. How's it going, guys? Going very, very good. How are things with you today? Oh, you know, it's up and down, but um, the new life is is, is is looking up. I grew tomatoes and chives and basil, and I actually made like Italian marinara sauce with basil in it. And yeah, it's kind of like I'm living like the other kids. Wow, we're going to have to get you a set of overalls now. Oh, no, no, we're not doing overalls. And camouflage jacket. Nope, we're good. We're good. <laughs> How is everybody today? Doing wonderful. Let's move on to the next call. I see Ashley. She has her hand up. Give a uh, give Joel. Give her a signal on mute. Ashley. Hello. 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 How you doing? Doing great. Is my video on? No, I think we have our videos off right now. We're doing videos off. We got got we okay. got some people that are doing unpleasant things every now and then in Zoom, so we're just leaving it off. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember those uh, that would flash every now and then from the old videos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how's it going so, with you? Oh, I'm. Oh my gosh! Freaking fantastic! Did you take that so, job? In uh, no, I didn't. Ah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was, um, I was feeling like a no about it still. And it's it, even after the call, I was feeling a no again. And I soon found out why there was so much heart opening to be had staying here. Ah. And yeah. So like my, with my best friend and her son and he graduated high school and he wanted me to be there. You know, he had his pick of family to be there, and he asked for me to be there. And so, whew, so it makes okay. me emotional. I, I just felt very, yeah, I, I, I feel very happy. And I think the way the summer's unfolded and the things going to Oregon, uh -huh. I don't know if I been, have been able to do that, to join you guys. If you had to Yeah. 
if I went to Florida, I don't think I would have been able to join you guys. Well, you are able to do it now. That's all that matters. Yeah. So um, I'm glad it was the decision I made. I, I feel like it was the right one for that time. Wonderful. Have you been able to continue with the rolfing? My rolfer has gone on vacation. So he's doing his summer sabbatical. So I'm not doing body work right now. Okay. But I did call in for a special update specifically. Well, tell me. Yeah. So I went to Mount Shasta. I saw you put that post up. How was it? it oh, man. It was so. I had been nervous about it, and I was a little bit nervous on the drive there because I, I'd never really experienced seeing, like, crafts in the sky, you know? Uh -huh. And that's what we were going to do. We were going to sit out and watch crafts some of the nights and um, do a lot of spiritual, life worker, fun stuff. <laughs> and so the, uh, the drive there, nervous, but it, it was all okay. Like, it all ended up being okay. Um, so the first night, we did see some blinking ships in the sky. Yeah, you always see shit up there because it's so there's so no light pollution. There was so much um, cloud cloaked ships. There was a lot of cloud cloaked ship activity. Like the the first couple of days we were there too. So was there was there was there was there was there a, a muffin top on top of clouds on top <laughs> of the muffin? There were muffin tops on top of muffin tops on top of muffin tops. Yeah, so that's that's called a, a triple lenticular. So usually when that's happening, there's an electromagnetic storm going on inside the mountain from the various uh, uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares that are going on. That means the mountain's building up a, an electromagnetic charge that will instantly eventually broadcast out. And that's probably why you're seeing a, a an odd assembly of sparkly lights everywhere. Um, well. Besides that, well, the first night, so I saw a blinking, we did like a, a, you know, a group meditation together, a lot of like-minded people. Um, there yeah. was some people who were awakened to their light language, and um, we had a channeler there, which brought a really cool dimension to the group. So um, Lily Nova, the person who hosted it, she mm -hmm. was, we were doing a sage ceremony in the beginning of it, and as she was saging me, she's like, wow. She's like, I can see some wings on your back. And mm -hmm. so I said, oh, freaking cool. Because like, I, I'm also kind of there as a pilgrimage to connect to my dragon self in Talos. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the first day, the next day, we did, we went up to the mountain and we did a like prayer meditation around the Sacramento headwaters where it bubbles up out of the mountain. Yep. And there was a, it's a keyhole shape. And so we kind of gathered around the keyhole and we did a prayer meditation and in, we split up, but in Lily's group, she had someone in her group that opened their dragon wings. That was a, a gift that um, mm -hmm. the, the king and queen of Talos had, you know, showed up for them and she was able to open her dragon wings. So I was like, wow, it was just, it was intense. I feel boosted. I'm very boosted from this entire trip. And I completely mm -hmm. understand now, I understand now why the place is not for everyone. Well, it's beautifully not. put, why it is not for <laughs> everyone. Okay. Beautifully put. Okay. There was some spookies and some oh. heebies and the GBs. Yeah. And so, you went at a time where the, where, the mountain had uh, shut off some really um, dingleberries that should didn't belong there. <laughs> so they that, okay? <laughs> shut up with a bunch of dingleberries, and and it was actually able to produce what its original purpose was, that energy that allowed awakenings to greater internal powers and strengths. And uh, while their journey begins, the, the, the wings are open, and then metaphorically, now what? Always is going to come. So when people have these experiences and the mountain opens them up to it, you know, it, this goes back to in ancient history. There's a reason people went to the mountains 
there's a silence, there's a quiet, there's an energy, there's an activation worldwide, this happens. But it happens to be where you have a massive tourist industry going on there. Mm-hmm. And the mountain treats treats everybody equally. Doesn't matter where in the spectrum you are, you're going to get what you get. Okay? You don't get what you want, you get what you need. Like the like the Rolling Stones song. <laughs> yeah. Don't always <laughs> get what you want. What you want. Exactly. You try sometimes. Get what you need. <laughs> um, so there's 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 more. I'd like to continue telling the story sure. to you. Oh, go ahead. Yes. But um the night, um, so my first night, I, I saw that blinking flash and it was just kind of heart opening. You know, I went there with the intention of uh having childlike joy again and just having a really good time uh-huh. i wasn't expecting much i just wanted to do that and uh-huh. you know uh-huh. just scope it out scope the place out see how i feel about it and um mm-hmm. i i actually had to set up a tent outside the house the first night because um that like the the house was full there weren't any beds so i signed up for that and okay. so the first night i, I slept outside um it was quite disturbing and it was hot and i ended up having a bad dream um, there was some, some spookies, some ghosts that showed up in my dream, uh, and it took place inside the, sh- the house, even though I was outside. Yeah, you, uh, went, you went at the height of tourist time, and at the height of tourist uh-huh. time, that mountain would get very, very, let's just say, um, has some corner drug dealer issues. <laughs> 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 crips and, energetic crips and bloods battling for territory. <laughs> Um, so I, I did, I did some due diligence, you know, before I went, like I would make sure to start my days with my morning prayers. I, I I did salt on my spine and my neck. I wanted to have dream experiences. Um, I did, well, you know, other things. I did some things like two, starting two weeks before. And so that night I had to deal with the spookies. And in my dream, I was like, I felt them energetically pass in my body. And I was like, this is bullshit. No, do anything. Nothing's working. And so I stood up, you know, and I declared to the house and I screamed at the top of my lungs, like, I cleanse and clear this fucking house. It was very empowering. And uh, the spookies were pouting and had to leave. So I I feel like um, that kind of metaphorically set me up for uh, facing my fears. You know, I was facing my fears in that trip a bit more. And um, so after that, I'm still there. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I'll take <you. laughs> Um, let's see. We eventually went to um, Cluedo's cave. Yep. Oh man, I didn't like that place very much. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you went at the height of tourist time, and that's a place where lots of predatorial energy show up. Yeah, so... If you ever go back, it's it's such a tough way to gauge when to go, because a lot of times the snow doesn't clear until mid-June, sometimes in even July, you still have big tall banks of snow up in Bunny Flats, you know, at 9,000 yeah. feet. So September is an odd time of year. It's all about if the rainbow hippie crews are having their drug-filled parties or not. Um, uh, so you got to pay attention. If they're on the mountain, don't go. Don't okay. go. Okay. Okay. Don't go. Yeah. And the month before and the month after, don't go. Okay. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible what they do to the physicality of the place and then the energies. It but was apparent. Yeah, that's why I like I like to say it's like the Las Vegas of sacred places. The house, <laughs> okay. The house yeah. out of wins. Okay. For sure. I mean, overall, it was nothing but magic for our entire group, our community. It was a great group. But um, for that, there's like 
three caves and then you get to the biggest cave that's uh-huh. deeper and darker and colder yep so the first cave it was stinky smelly you can tell a lot of people are peeing and probably doing yeah. drugs in there and all of us i think we were all dealing with our intrusive thoughts because of you know there was some dark energies mm-hmm. and so the next cave i feel like maybe it's kind of intensifying for people for me i felt like it got better and and worse and then by the time we got to the last cave i looked at it and i said nope heck no i don't want anything to do with that cave you can't see the exit i am i was terrified there's where your native american dna blood kicked in and said no bitch don't go (laughs) so that's what i was wondering i was like am i just being a am i being a pansy or is there really like is there not no, much no, benefit no, 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 for me to you are, not, you are not being a pansy, no. Okay. Oh, no, you weren't being a pansy. You were not oh, being I, a pansy. I had no FOMO for that last cave. No FOMO. I was like, you guys enjoy that. I went into a certain like mm-hmm. where I could still where I could still see behind. Ah, uh, you're breaking up. Are you there? I got there. Cave um images coming through. I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. There were really beautiful cave images where we sat. Yep. Yeah. So we got some benefit, but some of the people that went further in, they did an all lights out kind of thing when they got to the end point that they could go in. And some of them were having to deal with some of the darkness. They they reached a point of um, uh, dark night of soul type energy, I think. Mm-hmm. Anxiety. I think it brought them there. Maybe they, I don't know. So, you know, fair warning, anybody who's going to go in that cave, it might bring you to a new level of darkness. It may be a good thing. But it, I, don't, I didn't want anything to do with going further in. <laughs> Um, so after that, moving right along, <laughs> the next day we, uh, well, on the last day, well, there was other hiking and other waterfalls and beautiful things that we did, but we actually went to the top of the mountain where the la- the, the top area where we could go. So there was a clearing and there had been uh, a wedding ceremony there of, um, um, Aaron Kuhn and Amanda, they they do a podcast. They do Journey to the Truth podcast. And they mm-hmm. had gotten married. Um, they had a sacred circle for their sacred union. And so it was blessed and it was love energy. And, you know, we just sort of impromptu gathered hands and we just going with the flow. Like if anybody wants to do a prayer, let's, oh, hey, you know, let's send them some love. And so we gathered in unity around their circle of unity. and whoa did we do something we had prayer and meditation and just uh uh, someone started doing light language for us one of the persistent and that's when things things got really intense um people started like crying and shaking the energies i felt like we were all we were holding hands and i had the feeling that we all got really 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 light and we were floating in the air so what actually happened is Similar to that energy you experienced before, the electromagnetic buildup is like a volcano, and human as consciousness was the removing of the cork on the top. And everyone had their own unique individual vibratory experience that their consciousness went through an interpretation of. You gotta understand when you're working with these 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 pillars of energy that are coming out of the ground. Most of it is not connected to the myths that people believe. It's our internal myths, our internal stories that have been created that convert the energy into a believed system of experiences. When in fact, there's no need to have a believed system of experiences with those energies. They're there to expand consciousness in its interconnectivity. Now, when people have sacred ceremonies, et cetera, et cetera, 
again, that's the uncorking of the energy. That's what humans and general consciousness does when they're in these places. And the rest is the champagne spraying around. Ah, you're breaking up. Oh no. Am I am I there? You're, it sounds like you're back now, yes. Okay. Um, I just made a joke. I said it was like the sham uh Mount Shasta jizz all over us, like the champagne spray. Exactly, exactly. Energy. Mount Shasta jizz, yep. <laughs> Um, so after that we drove down to the we ended up at you know we were going to the next place and oh you know actually we stopped off at the portal um there was a, a doorway uh into the telos that someone uh lowell johnson had you know had an experience there so we decided to stop there we got some really cool images in our photos um you know lights big giant orbs and things and um it was very light, lightheaded there too. Um, we all kind of touched the portal and feel like jokingly knocked on the door. And well, I was jokingly doing it. Maybe some people felt serious. They wanted to go inside. <laughs> um, but we had a big group. And so later on, we ended up at Starbucks and um, the, the host had an experience where she, she's like, something just happened. Like, I feel like something weird happened while we we're sitting at the Starbucks and she was noticing, she's like, I feel like there's beings inside the Starbucks. And then, so later on, we did a channeling. And, um, well, the, the person there who channels, she channeled the Lemurians. And so she, we asked them questions. What, what exactly happened there? And what they had relayed in the channeling was um, that prayer that, or that energy that we were partaking in um stopped the timeline for a moment and uh, there was a time when we were kind of sitting in all of the dimensions and actually the electricity they said that we stopped the electricity in mount shasta for an hour in the city i wouldn't believe that i don't think so. you stopped the timeline i think <laughs> your 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 frequency got overloaded with vibration and your consciousness lost its internal clock, which is just entering the no time, and then you came back into time after the high wore off. Yeah, maybe that's a better, you know, maybe that's a better ex explanation. Like we were, uh, we entered no time together. Sure. Your consciousness no longer used its internal clock. It went to natural internal consciousness time, which isn't measured in seconds, minutes, hours, and years. It's its own eternal state state of perception. All right. So yeah, that 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 was pretty much it, and I I feel pretty boosted and pretty. Um, well, what are you going to do with these energies now? Well, I uh, my intention was to keep them going here to help fuel uh, what's what's next for me. So I, I moving out. And I felt inspired to begin a practice, you know, to start learning something uh, like uh, like like psychic surgery or something. You know, I feel like I finally have the energy. Whereas before the rolfing, I didn't have the energy to put towards that. You still got more rolfing to do. You know that, okay. right? Yeah, I, I did want to ask and, that too. and before you make the plastic light worker mistake of jumping into something before you're ready, mm -hmm. I think it's far more important that you listen to your own words, that you got to have more fun. Yeah. Okay? You've missed out a lot over the years. Okay. I like and that. Is, I'm, mm -hmm. You know you've missed out. This is the time where you just got to let it loose and play more before you jump in and put your mind into study 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 and what are you going to do with the skill you got so many other things to go out and experience go out and do friends family you know working on your own daily practice until it gets stronger but that's separate of the fun you need more fun in your life okay. you need more friends to have to have time with okay 
That's far yeah. more important for you to do the rest of the year than than taking something like psychic surgery or another class, even even hypnotherapy. I think that it would change the cycle inside your mind and you would avoid fun because you're putting it into the career. Okay. Okay? Yeah. You know, and the type I of like job that. that you do now, you 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 make circuit boards from the ground up for the for the government, very complex, uniquely focused work. And I think that that energy will jump into any new task you're going to put on as learning something, which is just going to steal time from having fun, community, friends, all those other things that you could do. Reconnect to your native roots. Yeah. Like um, yeah. on my list is learning um, some Navajo songs on the drum, like song and dance songs just for fun. Why? Why don't you try to find somebody that you can do not do the Navajo language worth so you can become yeah. fluent? Okay. I would. I that's on my list. I bought the uh, Rosetta Stone years ago and it's still sitting there. Well, break it out or go find somebody in the community to start start. You know, having somebody you can. You know, do I sound like a like a you know a foreigner when I'm talking, or do I sound somewhat fluent? Okay. I have family. I have family that can help me. You know, it was right in my then, house. Then, then invest into that. Okay. Invest in it. It'd be far more beneficial for you. Heck yeah. I love that. I freaking love that. So take this energy and have more freaking fun. Yeah. And remember what you missed out on. Okay? okay. Now it's time for me to not miss out anymore. Okay. I I, I have a... I do have a, a a question of something about something that was a little disturbing on my drive home. Uh huh. Um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I drove through. The, I drove the coast, which was really nice. Um, you, drove you drove the one hundred and one. You drove the one hundred and one. I drove CA. I drove one hundred and one and CA one. CA dash one. Okay. A combination of both. Um. So part of that, I had to go through, you know, the outskirts of San Francisco. And mm -hmm. as I was going to the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm, I, this is the first time. I've never actually been there. That I know of. <laughs> um, I went through the Golden Gate Bridge, and I was feeling a little inkling, a sense of deja vu. Uh, like something's coming. Uh, this is weird. And then immediately after the bridge, there's a tunnel, like a driving tunnel. And I was like, Oh man, this is straight from a dream. Mm -hmm. I was in a dream frequency completely. I was like, I've dreamt of this. I know this place. And immediately when we got out, it was happening more. And I looked on the GPS. I saw there was a park there that said portals of the past. I was like, oh great, that's that's ironic. <laughs> and then I I said, I'm going to freak out if I see a mall over here on the side of the road. And I did end up seeing the mall from just the dream, the same dream. So um, the, the problem, I've had this experience before where I've dreamt of places I moved to. Like I dreamt of Portland and I saw oh. the scenes from Portland and I didn't have any problem with that. It's like, ooh, I'm a psychic, but whatever, you know, I, I didn't care. This again is your native DNA sensitivity to the land coming through. Okay. Okay. Um, you had it in a dream. That means your DNA is interacting with it previously, meaning it was a very important marker stone in your life that you would remember through the dream that uh, this place had a significant meaning to the potential you moving to the future, meaning you did something right and you didn't do something wrong. Oh, shit. Okay. That's great. I love that. Um. What was disturbing for me is that I started to become ungrounded and the fear was taking over and yeah, I felt which is a the little... With the city energy rushing into you. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, I gotta get out of the city. Yep. I didn't, I didn't like the city. No, yeah, nor do I like the... passing by LA. Yeah, the city energy is terrible there. It's poisonous. Okay. So, I am... That's... Oh, that I love that. It's like hitting a timeline marker that would be significant. Yeah, you went by like road, road, mile marker two sixty six. You're in the right spot. You dreamed two sixty six before. You made it. Okay, we've arrived. <laughs> exactly. 
Okay, now the I don't have to freak out about it. <laughs> yeah, the future is ahead. Amazing. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Like that's that's all I uh, that's all I wanted to call. I feel like the Phoenix energy that you have on the the um the thumbnail is perfect for me. It was resonating with that right now. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I, I, I look forward to seeing you at the event. We're going to have a hell of a blast, and uh, we'll catch you soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank see you soon. Bye-bye. All, right. All right, Joel, let's spin up the Wheel of Colors and see who is next. All righty, then. Let's go ahead and ask Paul to unmute. Paul, are you there? Hey, Andrew. How are you today? Oh, good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Great. Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm calling from Calgary, Alberta. Calgary, Alberta. What do you want to talk about today? Well, I appreciate uh, your time, of course. My question is, uh, I'm 66 years old and retiring, and my wife and I are going to relocate somewhere in the United States. Okay, we, what are you retiring from? Uh, a corporate job, management job. Okay. How many and years have you been doing it? I've been with this company just over 20 years. Okay. What, so are, you do in, what are you going to do in your retirement? Well, that's, that's to be determined. Uh, something creative uh, is uh, where my interests lie. But my question is um, how to go about um, relocating to another location. So I wanted to ask if there's a suggested process to go through to try to find uh, an area that is most resonant with our with our energy. Snow or no, we'll start with this, snow or no snow? Uh, no snow. So we're-, we're Hurricane, uh, hurricane no, no snow, hurricanes or no hurricanes? Uh, no coastal living. No coastal living. No <laughs> snow, no coastal living. Cornfields or forests? Uh, probably more forest. Okay. And can you deal with humidity? Uh, yes, I grew up in Houston, Texas, so humidity is. Okay. So you are in the United States. You're going to be in the Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia. Tennessee, Lower Ohio Valley will be ideal places for you to look for places to retire. Property is the cheapest there in all the 50 states. Your other opportunity is going to be Idaho, Montana, but you're going to be dealing with snow up there no matter what. Same with Colorado. So no coastal, no snow, no hurricanes leaves you that section of the united states that's oh, obviously away from enough from the coast but in inward enough where it's the edge of the appalachians it's the Appalach appalachia area hey andrew well, yep uh he's from western canada so longmont longmont where we where we were is probably a good idea for him because they only they don't get that much snow up there well, it it rarely snows in the Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. They they get more ice storms than anything, and that's a rarity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, southern, you know, and that's the Ohio River, the Pitts, the the Allegheny Rivers into Pittsburgh too. But Pittsburgh can get snow too. But yeah, thanks thanks so much for that. I, <clears throat> that's actually an area we're targeting. We have a trip planned to the Tennessee area in middle of september but um some of my family lives in arkansas so i wanted to ask a more broad question is is it a good idea to live near uh womb chakras are you intending to do practice uh my personal practices uh maybe something maybe something more uh in a group fashion once I get settled to wherever I will be. Well, those energies are active whether you're aware of them or not, okay? And essentially what a womb chakra means is lots of birthing energy. 
So the fish spawning up streams and all the things that come with it, all the different life forces that are born. And that birthing energy has heavily, heavy influence over the growth of human consciousness. And even into the Tennessee Valley, you have huge birthing energies that go, go on in there from all the unique flora and fauna and water, water life that lives there. The key is you got to tap into it. Okay. And you got to learn to have your own personal relationship with it. Okay. It's mm -hmm. also important to know what you're going to do in your retirement. You know, you said creative. That means a lot of things. Do you really know what you're going to do in retirement? Uh, no, but I am um, approaching it with a positive frame of mind. And I know that once I get settled, I'll be active in some endeavors. Could be. You, you, you don't know the reality of how retirement's going to affect you yet. I know it's a big emotional adjustment, right? There's the detox. It's beyond an emotional. It's an energetic adjustment that ends up slapping the shit out of a lot of people. Yeah. Okay, you don't have that infrastructure that you go to every day that has a leadership matrix that you're interactive with. And once that leadership matrix actually you detoxify from it, what you'll discover is you give a lot of your own personal choice and willpower away to that job for decades at a time, and you find it very tough to start your own stuff. Yeah, that's how retirement affects a lot of people. Yeah, I I have challenging myself about how to stay disciplined and scheduled, even though I don't have this external influence. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is you got to discover a passion before you retire. Okay. Even if that passion ends up changing. David, do you have anything that you would like to add for somebody that's in that journey of dis dis disconnecting from the leadership matrix of a job and trying to retire oh i think i have a phd in this one <laughs> thank you um he's coming from a corporate environment and he's in western canada so um there are a number of things that he has to take into consideration number one he would want to live in a place that resonates with um some form of common sense <laughs> so he can't live in um too many um, places in the, um, uh, how should I put it? On he definitely is um, the East Coast is just dead for him. Um, so we're looking at, as you said, Virginia and those kinds of places. Um, he comes from big sky country, okay. Yeah. So coastal living is not going to go well with him at all, okay. Um, uh, he said that he can handle the humidity. Please understand that the humidity that you handled when you were younger will not be the same as the humidity that you would handle now um, in this um, space and time. And as you get older, your sensitivity to the weather becomes a little bit more acute. Um, honestly, if you're going to disconnect from um, the corporate environment, Andrew gave you some really good advice there. Uh, you got to discover a passion before you leave because the energy from corporate is not easily put down. I know, I know how that goes. You would like to see, you would like to just say, okay, I'm retiring. Everybody would like to retire, but your, you, your body can retire, but your mind is going to keep looking for certain markers, certain cues. So finding some sort of passion before you actually leave to redirect some of that energy is a good idea. It really is. And he sounds like he's been a lifer in corporate. So, yeah. Thank, thanks so much, David, for, for that advice. Yes, the, <laughs> that process is, uh, you know, I look forward to it and, and know that it will require uh, the same sort of dedication I have to my job is going to have to be to my personal development. I would also suggest that wherever you choose to live, remember that you are from Western Canada. You are used to a certain kind of living. I live in Western Canada, which is why I actually ran to Western Canada, Paul. All right. <laughs> You're used to a certain kind of living. So wherever you choose to live in the U.S. has to have some semblance of where you came from 
because it can be jarring if you choose um, to live in a place where um, simple courtesies that you are used to are not present, okay? Um, so as an example, I'm gonna give you the extreme example. You should not move to New York as an example. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I've been, been to New York, and yeah, those energies are more abrupt. <laughs> yes. So what Andrew's telling you, you come from big sky country. You want to see the sky. When you go to the bakery, you want, the, the people know your name, I'm sure. Yeah. The people know your name. There's a kind of energy that that, that is in Alberta. And I, I'm in Saskatchewan, by the way. Oh, okay. Right. right. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, there's a kind of energy that is here that you are going to miss i'm going to be very straight with you it's not right but i would suggest you find places where people still have those kinds of um energies running because that's what you're used to okay well thank you very much for saying it one one last question now a lot of my some of my family lives in arkansas now i know arkansas has a lot of crystalline um earth structure to it is it's it a huge rock hound area same with tennessee kentucky mm -hmm. upper upper um alabama it, there's you can rock hound on the surface and within 10 inches of many places under the surface you remove the dirt and you'll find full crystalline structures and there are many people have made massive wealthy finds just from rock hounding through the woods in those areas but, but is it a good idea to live above these energies? Most of the time, you'll never know. Okay. But you'll never know. The vast majority of, of parts of Arkansas are, are very heavy crystal and limestone that's half a mile thick, followed by granite. But that's all of the South is like that. And it all has moving water underneath it. And it's what creates the soup of electromagnetic energy that attracts the spawning life there, okay? okay? You need those high fields, okay? Where you come from, you have a form of it, and what you will discover is those areas, their modulation is much stronger than what you're used to. You use the scientific frequency modulation. The, the waveform is going to be much more intense, and it will take time for you to get used to. Yeah, we're definitely not going to live in an urban area. No, it, I mean, there are plenty of places that have 100,000, 75,000 people in them, and they're beautiful towns all throughout the, that Middle South. Okay? Yes. Okay? Beautiful places to live with, you know, decent-sized homes. I, I, mean, I mean, there's not a lot of jobs there, but that's fine. That's, that's not really what you're going there for. Exactly. Yes. Okay? So let me ask you about your corporate work. You just basically were a, were a manager? Well, I mean, uh, my trade is accounting. So right now I do tax management for the organization I work for. OK. So you're a, you're a bean counter? Yes, by trade. OK. Have it's you done color, anything else? It's the color of the beans, Andrew. It's the, yeah, it's the color of the beans, exactly. <laughs> Have you done anything else? Uh, no, not uh, professionally. OK. Have you done any, do you have any hobbies? Uh, <clears throat> well, since I've been exploring a lot of your work and, and I do a lot of structure around that. And so hobbies would be writing. I mean, I like to just sit down and write. So I have a book idea that is uh, something I want to pursue uh, when I, have the detox time and, and get relocated. So yeah, thanks for asking. Okay. Do you do any outdoor sports? Yes, I like to ride the bicycle. Okay, what about hunting and fishing? Um, not hunting. Um, fishing, I haven't done much, but uh, uh, that is something to be contemplated. Okay. You're gonna be going to an area where water sports, hunting and fishing, is absolutely everywhere and i mean absolutely everywhere you got to know that and there are parts of the kentucky tennessee valley 
that have these man-made lakes that are fingerling lakes that are Lake Milton that connects over like a 700 mile period place. Okay. And water sports are probably going to be one of those things you'll have to adapt to. Okay. Right. So maybe consider getting a boat okay, while you're down there um, because you can still do work on your boat. Okay. You can still be in that retired energy. Um, it's just something you're going to have to adapt to with the energies there. And, yeah. and like I said before, you got to find something that's passionate before you leave. If you don't, what you're going to discover is the self-starting energy isn't there because the, the leadership matrix that your brain will tap into isn't feeding back to you. Okay. Okay. For, really appreciate that advice. Yeah. Really put some extra effort in finding, even if that passion changes, finding okay. something before. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the information and advice, and, and thanks so much, David, for your input. All right, brother. Take it easy. Good talking to you. Okay, you too. Talk to you later. Bye. All right, uh, uh, Joel, let's spin up the wheel of callers and see who is next. Okay, let's see here. Marie, signal to unmute. Marie, are you there? Marie, are you there? One, ah, 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 ah. Two, ah, ah, ah. Three, ah, ah. Well, let's move on to the next. Count and count, counted her out. All right, Angel Garcia, signal to unmute. Angel Garcia, are you there? Yes, right here, Andrew. How are you doing, Angel? Been a while since we talked. Oh my God! Everything that has happened since I last spoke to you—what it's been like seven, eight years? I was, I was living in Topanga at that time. Uh huh. I remember. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's just wild. But uh, you mentioned—I'm uh, living now in Ukiah, up in Northern California. Good job. Yeah, it needed to happen. Um, a lot more peaceful, and it was great to get away from LA. Um. But uh, wow, it's just amazing. You know, the last time I spoke to you, Andrew, you brought up Don Jose Sandoval, which old elder at the Sierra yep. Nevada Mountains. Mm -hmm. And you said that there was some kind of a lineage connection between me and him. And I'm like, wow, I've never met the guy. I don't think I have. And you said, yeah, you think you've met him at some point. Um, but he's calling out to the relatives and whatnot and calling people in well you know what andrew three years after that three or four years after that i actually went to find him even though i didn't really know whether he was going to be there or not but i made my way down to mexico down to um, guadalajara i landed in guadalajara took a bus bus out and then eventually ended up going all the way up into the sierra nevada mountains to the town where i had found out that he lived and he happened to be there <laughs> and i just it basically just showed up unannounced did he talk to you yeah he, he you know at first he's like who the you know he must have thought who the hell is this guy showing up out of nowhere i mean i'm telling you this town is like way 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 up there it's deep in the cartel country too <laughs> i didn't even know you know what yeah. now that you mentioned that now that you mentioned that yeah there was an incident when I was leaving and I went, they took me down to one of the closest little towns. Um, and that's where I would take the bus to move on, you know, but I stayed at a hotel and uh, I'm like looking across the way from my room and I'm seeing these guys with, with like, like not rifles, but machine guns. And I guess yep. it was the cops. And I think they were setting up, to go somewhere to go look for the cartels or whatnot. And I'm like, mm, I don't think it's probably a good deal for me to stay here. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I left there. But yes, I got to meet Don Jose Sandoval. I didn't really tell him about how or why I showed up. I just wanted to leave it open. I was there for three days, went there, just sat with him. We, you know, he took me in. We'd, there were several ceremonies, family ceremonies that I got to be a part of. Huh? And 
So just kind of like went through the motions. I just felt like I needed to accomplish that and, and do that in order just to connect with them without really getting into asking them a tons of bunch of questions. I just wanted to be able to just be present with him and his family. And you did. And I did. You know, I don't know what answers I got, but I had a good time. <laughs> you know, it's just. Uh, it's That's just, all your soul needed, though. How yeah. did life change? How did life change after you got back? Uh, uh, you know, I I think coming and moving out of uh, L.A. was a big thing. Uh -huh. um, I had been talking to my wife about it for a while just to kind of make that convincing. And I was like, hey, you know, I think this would be a good idea and it's closer to work because, you know, I've been working in the cannabis industry for years and years. Uh -huh. um, but uh, so I did make the move up here. But, you know, Andrew, working in that industry, I don't I don't anymore. As of last year, uh -huh. I think it just did a number on my lower back. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm feeling the repercussions of that. Talk about not being a spring chicken anymore. Well, there's ways that you could fix that lower back. And it's just going to require you taking some due diligence and effort and getting somebody to come in there and do lower back releases learning learning something like like a really advanced form of yoga and putting some absolute diff, really good effort into it you can reverse a lot of back stuff david you want to add anything about yoga and lower back pains yeah people please, i would appreciate it yes i was muted again um so i would need some background information tell me about your lower back pain exactly where is it uh down the lower vertebrae um recently i got an mri done and there were two bulging discs where and it give, got me the number. give me the letters and the numbers honestly david i really don't remember what the numbers okay so so l l l let me walk you through it okay okay um your spine is um divided into um six sometimes seven uh, -huh. uh bones in your neck 12 bones in your upper back Okay. Five bones in your lower back and another five bones right at the tail, right? So okay. I'm going to ask you a question. Is your pain right at the tail, the S region? Right at the tail, yes. Okay, so it's near your coccyx, basically where you sit down, correct? Um, no, I would say it's higher. I would say it's higher than that, not, not okay. at the tail, right above the, right above the, the butt, you know? So it's in the, the beginning it's, of that base. Okay, so it's in the lumbar region of your back. So you yes. have bulging this in the lumbar region of your back. Mm. That's the first thing that we have to do. Question, is it referring any pain down your legs at all? Well, it did. This last bout that I had, eventually it uh, start, I started feeling pain down my leg. It had never that had never happened before. And boy, it was four months of pain that I went okay. through. Yeah. Okay. So your sciatic nerve is involved. So my question is, how far down your leg was the pain referred? You know, it went down as not to my foot, but down to the front part of my my leg, lower part of my leg. Okay. So yeah. it was a major pain you were in, obviously. Major. Yeah. Constant. Constant. Right. Um, yeah. So they told you that you had bulging disc. Is that correct? There was two. At two different spots, yeah. Okay, so that's um, L bones, two bulging bones, and the L bones. Here are the things that you're going to need, okay? Yes. You're going to need to create some space in the bulging discs. Bulging discs are exactly what they say they are. They're discs in your, your this, when they say this, they mean the vertebra, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the foraminia in between them, they're bulging. So the foraminia are like, this is how your spine is um, um, configured. You got bones and then you got a little spongy pad between them and then another bone and a spongy pad and yeah. so on, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, as you get older, depending on what you do, these um, bones and the spongy pad degrades, the bones probably bulge, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, you're looking at trying to give yourself some traction immediately. Okay, mm -hmm. meaning space, right? 
Yes. And I think whenever somebody says structures, it means pulling something apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, not tractor, traction. And so what you're going to have to do is learn how to give yourself some space. So here are the things that you can do right off the bat. Okay. To reduce your, pray, your pain. Um, pause yoga for a moment. Let's do some physical therapy on yourself. You find uh, a counter. You okay. put your hands, a very firm counter. Okay. Put your hands down on the counter mm -hmm. and push up like you want to take yourself off the ground, but don't, don't leave the ground. Leave the rest of your body limp so that when you push up, the um, shoulder girdle, the, the collarbone, and the scapula are causing upward force on your spine, which will pull on your spine. You will hear little cracking noises, mm -hmm. and that is the first thing that you probably need to do. Okay. The second thing that you need to do is lie down on the ground. I know a lot of people um, get yourself on a firm, flat mattress that's, well, a uh, mat or something. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring your knees up to your chest, one at a time, first of all. Bring them both up to your chest and just pulse them in. Hold your knees and pulse them in and out of your chest. That will give your lower back traction. Okay. Can you picture that? You're lying on yes. the mat. Yeah. Both your knees are pulled into your chest. You're holding onto your knees mm -hmm. and you're actually pulling, passing, pulling. pulling in and out slowly yes. to give the lower back traction. Mm -hmm. That is to give yourself some relief from the pain, because if you don't get relief from the pain, you're not going to do any kind of yoga anyway, okay? Mm -hmm. And like, um, whenever we give you guys advice, um, we don't talk off the top of our heads. Um, I'm going to tell you guys this right now. When Andrew is speaking and when I'm speaking, mm -hmm. it's because I've actually had discs crushed in my lower back myself. Oh. I have been through this. So you understand? <laughs> oh yes, I understand. Yeah. This is why I ask you the series of questions I asked you. Yeah. I used yoga to come back from that when it was suggested that a doctor go into my back and do back surgery on me. I said, no, I'll do it myself, thanks. Mm. Okay. Yes, so, because you know what? I was considering that, you know, like at this point I'm like, God, do I have to do surgery? Is this gonna be, or, or I'm always gonna be afraid of any movement causing this pain to come back. And okay, it I'm, just feels like I'm really, you know, delicate in that spot. Okay, so I'll tell you my story, and that'll help you understand. I okay. was doing weightlifting, mm -hmm. and the weight that I was holding above my head was heavier than I was. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting on a bench, and it caused the lower back discs to squeeze and pinch some nerves down there, which referred pain down my leg. Oh. The pain is indescribable. Oh, I know. It's the kind of pain when it hits you. You Drops it to the ground, right? Yeah, it, it the you, ground. you can't even scream. It hurts that much. You mm -hmm. can't, you can't say ow or anything. So, um, I went to a doctor because I was in pain twenty four hours a day. It was um, causing my heart to um, actually, um, because when you're in pain, obviously your heart rate stays up, right? Mm -hmm. And he gave me, he put me on something called Motrin, which was not a good thing back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he said that we got to operate on your back. And at some point in time, I was like, yeah, no, no, I'm not doing that. I have mm -hmm. my whole life ahead of me. I'm not doing that. So mm -hmm. I went the road less traveled, and I decided to use my knowledge of yoga to take this, this pain away. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that it's not an easy road, but I'm going to tell you that five months after that pain, that incident, Mm -hmm. I went back after that same weight again, and I lifted it up. So my point is the following. Here are the things that you need to do to create some space. Lat um, the top traction is when you put your hands down on the counter and you press upwards. Okay. Give your back some space on the top. And lying down and put, put, pulsing your knees into your chest will give your back some traction at the bottom, which will relieve some of the nerve pain that you're having. Okay. The yoga poses that you are going to need, don't try to be fancy and don't try to get inventive, are the child's pose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so when you're, uh, when you're lay, leaning back on your knees and in a hunched position and you're leaning back, do not sleep on the child's pose. It is extremely effective for a number of things. Okay? Okay. 
You're going to need the child's pose. You're going to need the following thing. You know what Sukhasan is? It's no. when you sit cross-legged. It's just basically basic cross-legged sitting okay. on the ground. Okay. Then you're going to try to put your elbow down to the left. You're going to try to put your elbow down to the right. That is the sideways traction. Does okay. that make sense? Makes sense, yes. Then you're going to try to do spinal twist, which is just try to turn from the root of your body and turn the bones to the left, turn it to the right. That is a spinal twist. Do it from Sukhasan. Don't go into the yoga books and watch some guy, some Indian guy, wrap himself up like a pretzel. Keep it real simple. Okay. okay? <laughs> Hear you. Keep it real simple. That guy has been doing that since he was like, like he came out of the womb. Don't <laughs> try to get very, I'm going to try to find, um, Andrew, can you give me, um, um uh, something to um share my screen do i have permissions uh yeah joel can you make him co-host we're good i think i'm hoping yeah you're I'm, gonna put this on, uh, I'm gonna i'm gonna um put this on screen so that you are not confused okay thank you david do you see this this is so yeah. awesome oh okay okay all right, this is Sukhasan. This is the Charles pose. That is the Charles pose. That cha that pose is don't get into this. Yeah. Keep it this. Yes, I've done some of that. Yeah. It's okay. basic. It's very. This is the Charles pose. Spinal twist from Sukhasan. Uh, that is a spinal twist on Sukhasan. Okay, mm -hmm. I imagine you're in this position before you do the spinal twist, okay. and you're facing. Don't get into this stuff here. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Okay, All right. Spinal twist from Sukhasan, and before you do that, you're going to try to put your elbow down to the left. Mm -hmm. And down to the light by the, by this bending sideways on each side. Okay. Okay. You're going to keep doing that, and then there will be a little crack. There will be little cracking sounds in your body, right? Mm -hmm. But you're trying to. Let me show you. Um, anatomy of the spine. All right. Let's look at the sagittal view of the spine. This is how your spine is. Mm -hmm. So you're getting pain right in this area here. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. so if you look at the spine from the uh, the, the, the um, frontal plane, you see what I'm talking about, right? Yes. So you're going to push down and raise, and you're going to try to try to straighten this up, right? Yes. Okay. Create space. That's mm -hmm. what I was talking about. When you're lying down on your back and you're pulling your knees in, you're going to all of this is going to be curled in, right? To create okay. space inside here. Make sense? Yes. I'm gonna just do one more search here. Traction of the hold on one sec. Let's try this as okay. self traction upper back. Look, self-traction. This is what I'm talking about, pushing up. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. As, don't get into this. You don't need to <laughs> traction your neck, okay? That's neck decompression. Okay. Right? You don't need to. That is what I'm talking about right here. Push. Oh, that's what I was imagining. Hey, David, do you think it's a good idea to get one of those inversion inversion benches or those that kind of get you upside down? All right. Let me give you this joke, right? So, uh um a guy who lived um in toronto got himself got himself an inversion um thing right uh -huh. and he's he's a naturalist right so okay. he, he likes to do his inversions naked right so um it all went wrong when he got tied up in his inversion machine and he couldn't untie himself from the inversion machine and uh -huh. he had to call um maintenance in his apartment to come and release him and um yeah he was naked Right, so <laughs> don't get an inversion machine. Keep it okay. simple. This is what we're talking about. All right, mm -hmm. upper traction. You could you you could probably use this as well for traction on your back. 
Okay. And I'm talking about bringing your knees up there and holding your knees and pulling it this way, yeah. pulsing it this way. Yeah. And that will absolutely um, help you with the pain level. Thank you so much, David. How often were you doing that? Because I mean, how long did it take for you to get to back to the point where you felt confident enough to go ahead and lift weights? It significantly reduced within a month, within less than a month, actually. It was less than a month, sure. right? And then I decided to step up my game. And um, years later, I became a yoga teacher for the Yoga Alliance and taught yoga teachers yoga. Yeah. So <laughs> it was a journey. It's a journey. <laughs> Yeah, it feels wow. When you're in that pain, you just feel like it's never going to end. Do you feel like you're going to be that way for the, for the rest of your life? No, you're not going to be that way for the rest of your life. But if you do not take action, you mm -hmm. will have an issue. Okay. Yes. And I can tell you that that pain, I I, I really do understand it. Uh, they they actually put me on drugs to manage it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was a druggie for five months. Wow. And I had to wean myself up for that too because drugs are wonderful, let me tell you. <laughs> Especially pain medication is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Like Andrew could tell you, it's like when they put your pain medication, all your worries go away. So mm -hmm. you yeah. don't want to go down that road. No, I'm glad I I'm road. glad I haven't done that. Yeah. Right. Haven't you don't want to go down that road, let me tell you. So my suggestion would be um that you go down the other road, which is um taking charge of your own health right and that pain is a great teacher i know for me that pain made me become the yoga teacher that i was because i could empathize with other people's pain okay that pain don't look at it as just continually negative there are things it's trying to teach you it really is i appreciate you a lot that that means a lot what you just did what you just showed me well that's okay about that because I do understand what pain you're in. Believe you me, I do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. Well, it's great to be here in this room with you guys. And Andrew, it's it's great to be able to talk to you again after all these years. And it's been about seven, eight years. Well, yeah. thanks for coming back. Yeah, definitely. Um, could I ask one more thing? Sure, go ahead. It, this is kind of like going left field now all of a sudden. It's about Bigfoot. Okay. I've been... For the past several months, I've been kind of fascinated by because I, I I never really thought about it much, but for some reason something was just all of a sudden caught my attention, and I started going deep into into that world, you know, and learn trying to learn as much as possible and what the different experiences that people were having. And it's interesting that you also have been having people on talking about the topic. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, it seems like to me. Yeah, we had Bigfoot Month. Uh, yeah, um, on the uh, the native native crossroads. Yeah, so I'm normal. finding it interesting that the timing, you know, it's like all of a sudden you you guys are talking about it, and I'm like learning what I can through you as well and everyone else. And and um, but there's one particular name that really kind of came to me recently, um, Mark Barton, and I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yes, I have. And his experience was kind of mind blowing to me. And I was like, whoa, 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 what's this all about now? What is this connection that he spoke about with regards to, to Bigfoot and the, the whispery hooded creatures that he talked about that, that pretty much did a number on him, kind of made him go a little crazy, you know? Um, what is the connection there? Cause I feel like that's kind of a very big deal. Uh, I mean, it's kind of major in a sense. If if there is some connection between different species, different species, yeah. Okay. Why, were they, why, why were they trying to kill him? A different species that have different purposes, have different forms of territorial, and then there are subspecies within species that have, are not friendly to humans because they've been hunted for so long. And then there were other species who are similar to Bigfoot, but genetically they are predators and they will remain predators. Their genetic lineage won't change out of being a predator, which exists in nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was dealing with a predator group that just wasn't going to change. Mm -hmm. So th those are the wispy, dark, shadowy, you see in your periphery 
beings mm-hmm. that have the ability to create illusions in the mind. We just talked about this on the Bigfoot shows. Mm. They can generate a smell, even though the smell is not actually there, but your brain believes it, it believes it is. Yes, I've heard. They yeah. have an understanding of how sensory perception works, and they can mask and create all sorts for swarms of manifested sensory illusions that have a real factor to it. Because once we smell something, our belief engine kicks in. Once mm-hmm. our belief engine kicks in, we generate an energy, whether it's fear or whatever it is. And once that belief engine starts creating energy, they're able to harvest it and use it more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, he was on a, when I heard this that particular interview with uh, Kerry Arnold, which he eventually was passed away in a car accident after the interview, maybe about a year or so after that, you know. It, it almost feels like there's a connection there. Are you being affected by something? Yeah, like well, this accident that happened to this car accident, because it's funny that Mark Barton actually mentions, oh, these guys can kill you in different ways. It could be a heart attack, it could be a car accident. And and then I'll look, you know, then a year later, Kerry Arnold dies in a dies in a, a car accident. And he's like, yeah. the one doing Not, some of the stuff people say are a little over the top and bombastic. But mm. Mm. are you familiar with uh, Dave Pilati, Pilates? Uh, Pilates? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, is in, he has talked about the tens of thousands of missing people at the national parks for well into two decades now. Mm-hmm. There is clearly a predatory species in and around the, the national parks that no one wants to talk about. Okay. And they can take people at will for whatever reasons that they they have. At the same time, the volume in which they could take is is it's not there. They take out a very they take only what they need. Okay, yeah. they're not venturing into the city, the major cities, and having wanton destruction. Mm. Okay, because if they did, there would be a wanton destruction response to them. We'd roll in with tanks and burn the burn the forests down. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there's a a delicate truce that exists. Okay. First thing first, don't fall into fear. You fall into fear, you've already lost. I agree. Okay. I agree. That means you have to step up your daily practice, step mm-hmm. up your process. Get yeah. your, identify the parts of you that are still susceptible to fear processes mm-hmm. and begin immunizing yourself with, with energies that can counter fear. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with you, Andrew, with that. You know, because, yeah, it's just like there's, there's that awareness. You can understand that there is this kind of relationship. There's this dynamic happening. There's, this is happening, and it's coming more to the fore. Now... Are we going to be in fear about it and just kind of, you know, I mean, it seems like this has always been the case. It's just be, it's just coming out a little bit more. We're being more aware of, of what's going on in our surroundings. Um, that's what I'm seeing. You're becoming more aware. Mm-hmm. And the interviews activated an aspect inside you that still is dealing with the fear. And that aspect that's dealing with the fear is trying to make it into a phobia with inside you. Mm. That, David, mm. anything you want to add well, when fears are turning into phobias and how you can deal with that part of the mind and the mental health issue that creates from too much fear? Muted. I believe we lose David? David. I think David's gone. Yeah, David's gone. I don't see him on here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he might have to take a call. Um, all right. Yeah. So when fear becomes rooted and we've ignored it long enough, mm-hmm. it tries to take the inch that becomes a mile every opportunity that it gets. And every opportunity you let something into your environment in awareness or unawareness mm-hmm. and do nothing about it. You give it more moral authority to take charge when you're not in charge. 
Mm -hmm. And then it develops the identity that I'm the soul and you're not. Yeah, you can always try to stay in awareness, uh, always kind of keep an eye on that, make sure that it doesn't get, you know, overwhelms you or keeps you free will, things. Free will, free will can be a bitch. Yeah. And you we know, must use it at all times. Yeah. Let's express our ability with it at all times. And I'm wondering with this, um, you know, my son, Kopal, I had mentioned him to you the last time I spoke to you. Um, he went through something a couple of years ago where it was like this really intense transformation. And it seemed like he was having these really major panic attacks to, to, to the point where I could see that it was really, you know, I could see it in his face. And he was just afraid to sleep in his room. So he would sleep in the living room. And, you know, I'm like, I really didn't understand exactly what was going on in, in that time. I don't know if you have any input as to what might might have been happening at that time for him. Why was how long, ago, so, how long ago was this? This is about a year, a year and a half ago, two years. And how old was he then? He was 18. Has he dated girls and lost his virginity yet? Yes. Well, he had one girlfriend and he broke up about several months back. And that was a big part also of like the changes. Right. That so he, he, his issue is he's creating portals from the missing love and is having to deal with that, having that sexual energy in there. And mm -hmm. he got into a haunted dream world possibly through porn and masturbation but not mm -hmm. necessarily just that mm -hmm. that's a fear of going to sleep he tapped into something he shouldn't okay yeah eventually it subsided and he was able to sleep you know because he was feeling a lot of negativity in the room for some reason but eventually that passed and then he was able to to go yeah, he able to overcome it. yeah yeah able to overcome it yeah and he did and now he's very like you know, very in tune with like what he's eating and wanting to have a better diet. And he's very focused on that, on the diet. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to yeah. see him kind of get into that, which is great. Like he, he feels like it's it's helped him quite a bit. Um, but he's still very, I think there's still like there's fear there because he's not very social. He doesn't want to get out much, you know. And I'm always, I'm always thinking, well, when we were at that age, we were like running around and taking off with friends. He also got kicked out of the house. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mom wanted to be in the house alone. We we were that generation where we didn't get to be in the house. It was get the hell out and don't come back till lunch or dinner. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there was like eight, eight. You know, I have like seven siblings, so it's like there's no there's no hanging out in the house much. And it's like get the hell out and go out and play and take off and run around the neighborhood. Right. And come back at night. <laughs> Pretty much. That's what I grew up. Yeah. yeah, and it's a, it's a whole nother scene for them. Yeah, a whole nother scene for them. A whole nother scene for them. Well, thank you for that info, um, Andre. You're welcome. And it's really it's nice to be able to speak to you again. Talking. Yeah. Good All right, brother, take it easy. Good talking to you. Take care. All right, Joel, we're going to call it an end to the show right now. I am tired. I'm whooped out. We will be back tomorrow for our ongoing Loosh Report, Season 1 of the Apocalypse, Episode 5, as we are giving you the Loosh Report before we start our Friday night game stream. Come on and join us for this new evolving way of telling you what's going on in the strange, ridiculous world that we're all eating popcorn and watching and waiting for the next crazy thing to happen in the Apocalypse, Episode 5.